Hey, camera's on. <laughs> continual word of the day, but today the words are not so controversial as they're just fun. Uh, A-N-A-R-I-T-H-M-E-T-O-S. And arithmetos. And arithmetos. Now the cool thing about this word is that the and is the arithmetos. And is, this is, if you look at your notes there, that and, the A part, is a negative participle like we find in Greek all the time. So it's the suffix or the prefix that means not. It doesn't mean not arithmetos. The translation of this word, it, it comes from arithmetos, which comes from arithmos. And you guys know what this, what, what is this? Arithmetic, yeah, yeah, arithmetic, <laughs> which arithmetos in the Greek means counting. Now, this is the cool part. Okay, why does it mean counting? It, when I say arithmetic to you, what do you think of? <laughs> mathematics, right, which is a short for arithmetic. But mathematics to us is you know, one plus one is something, or one minus whatever, right? We have all these, because we know formulas. And what did you do? You memorized them, right? Well, in the ancient world, they, okay, yeah, it's all messed up. Base five, well, in base five, there are issues. What's the problem with base five? Well, if I said, I, I want you to add something for me, and I give you like V I X I, and say add it. So, oh, this is two X V. No, no, that's not the way it works. Well, I can't do it, right? But if I do, if I do our, um, they're Arabic. We use Arabic numbers, right? right. Arabic. That's four. Plus nine, that's, that's six, seven, seven. Or eleven. <laughs> <laughs> that's six. six. That's six. <laughs> plus <Close>. See? <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> but all I have to do if I'm doing uh, base ten yeah. is I just add the right. right? Well, you see. Now, what did you have to do in the old days? If you had base five, you had to. Count. So, arithmos in Greek means to count. And remember I told you, six in Greek is five plus one. Seven in Greek is kind of each five plus two. The thing is that you had to count to figure this stuff. And, you know, one of the, one of the greatest inventions that we've taken away from children one of the greatest inventions in arithmetic, in mathematics. What's that? <laughs> Memorization. Yeah. Memorization. Look, if, if, okay, you don't know this because no one told you this, but people memorize books. People memorize books. If you were literate, you memorize books. Why would you memorize arithmetic? Yeah, but if you don't do it, right? I mean, I'm, I'm doing taxes. I'm doing taxes at my register and figuring the change out for you. How many people had change? How many people had money? Yeah. You know, we assume, like, you know, right now I don't care any money because you know my dad used to have a pocket full of change because there used to be a time when we all carried money in our pockets, right? Today, the pennies are worth nothing, so nobody carries change. But, you know, the thing is that back in the day, people did not have access to money. When people had money, money was a big deal. And so our assumption from our culture is money is ubiquitous and everywhere. But if you don't make, if, 
Look, you couldn't send Johnny. I mean, yeah, I guess you could. There are barter tech. This is barter, right? Barter, and the few people who have money, which is really good, because if I have a denarius and I and I can buy stuff, this is like greatness in the world. But guess what? How many denariuses did I have at any one time? That's right. One maybe when I got my day's wages. And then you had that one lady who had ten coppers. Remember that? In the in the in the gospel. Yeah. Remember she had ten coppers, she lost one, and she went looking all over the house to find it. You know, people impo impoverished people in the past recognized that because that could happen to them. Today, if I lose a penny, I might not even pick it up because there ain't a copper in there to mean anything. So, in the day, in the day when arithmos meant just counting, right? But, and I'll go back to my point. The, the invention of teaching children to memorize arithmetic is amazing. Because that allowed them to do stuff that is science. You can do science. What did they have to do? What if I went from, um, number one, they didn't have formulas. But if I had to do, let's say, multiplication. They didn't. You know what they had? They had tables. They had tables, just like we have log tables, right? Logarithmetic tables. They had tables to do mathematics, like to, to do multiplication and division. And, he, and, and think about powers, right? All of this comes from counting, right? Multiplication is a type of counting. Division is a type of counting. Powers are a type of counting until you get to logs. Now, logarithmetic functions are unbelievable. And we still, well, Today we use our calculators, but there was an era when all the log tables were in the back of books and you had to look them up. And if you were really good, you had a slide rule. A decky log log slide rule will let you figure out the logs and do advanced powers and stuff. But in this era, they couldn't do it. So one of the greatest inventions that we gave to, to education was memorization. And now... The kids can't add, subtract, multiply, and divide because we do new math. Whatever the heck that is. I don't even know what new math is. You know, it, it, it's insanity because we used to teach memorization and kids, guess what? Now we've gone back to the Stone Age. They're like the Greeks. Can you give me some change? Can you figure me some tax? How about doing a, a mortgage for me? Anyway, uh, unbelievable to me, but I, I love this word and I thought it was a really cool word to have. The word translated here means unnumbered. But it, and, and they say IE without number and therefore innumerable. Mm. That's not exactly what it means though, right? You can tell this. It might mean um, not countable. Not countable. So, so much that it can't be counted. But I can think of a lot of other um, expressions why it could not be counted. But I think uncountable is probably the best. Here's a word, C-H-E-I-L-O-S. Chileos, chileos. The reason I picked this word is because it's really, remember that word we have, um, there's a word that we've been seeing all the time. Uh, ca uh, chasm, Chas chasma, chasma, which means a, ch a chasm, right, a chasm, but is, is, is a Greek word that means a space between. And we see this word a lot. In this case, chalios is the physical form of this chasm. It means literally, well here, a lip, as in a, a pouring place, a margin of water. So the margin of water. Now, uh, one thing that's very interesting about this, anybody been to Greece? Yeah? How many sandy beaches do they have? There are some, but mostly it's rocks. rocks and cliffs. And sometimes you go, well, you know, how could you even get a boat in here? Because they were 
one of the reasons they were a great seafaring force is because they had some secluded harbors like Athens, Pyrenees, Pyrenees that south, that's south of Athens is the main port, right? And it's a protected harbor where there is some pretty deep harborage. And there's lots of deep harborage around Greece. There's not a lot of places to bring the boats up on the shore which means you, you're protected from invasion, which one of the reasons their culture stayed so powerful for so long. But Toledos means basically, it's translated a shore or a lip, but it's, it's literally a margin of water. And I, 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 don't know, I thought that was kind of interesting because it really fits within, um, you know, you can see what we would call a seashore. They didn't have a word, they had, their closest word is chasm. Hmm. Interesting. And then this word, we've had this one before, but not in this class. Uh, uh, a a s s e s, thalassus thalassa. It means a sea, a sea, and it comes from halus. It comes from salt. So the word <coughs> sea is an extension is extension of salt, which means thalassa. Uh, very interesting. The Sea of Galilee is a thalassa because it's salty. But the, what's that other one that's the northern one that's not salty? Um, the Sea of Galilee. The sea of Galilee is not salty. The Dead Sea is salty. The Dead Sea is, oh, what did I say? I said it backwards. The Dead Sea is salty, therefore it's a thalassa. But technically, the, the Sea of Galilee is not a sea because it's not salty. Greeks were big time into salt water stuff. They did not call anything a sea that wasn't salty. Anyway, the, not, not very controversial words, but fun words that I think that we'll see and we've seen before and they tag into what we were talking about. Let's see. So I am at, uh, we are at 10. Well, let's see. Get me, get me to 10 here. And we have done with 10. Why do I have so much before? Oh, I have so much before because there's one that, that fits into this. There is one thing that I, I didn't, wasn't, wasn't able to finish on 10. So we already parsed 10. Here's the NIV for 10. Uh, for looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And this is the Greek. Um, this is a literal Greek. Assigning a reason he accepted from some source, the town with walls held something put down, the artisan and worker for the people of God. People of God. And... I told you that this probably relates to Jerusalem. Probably means specifically Jerusalem. Here's a very interesting quote from Wisdom. Wisdom is one of the apocryphal <coughs> books that's in the Septuagint. So the readers, we aren't familiar with these because they stripped them out of our Bibles in uh, 1826, but everybody else in the whole world was until 1826. Their Bibles had the Apocrypha if they had a Bible, and all the Septuagints had the Apocrypha. So wisdom tells us in 13.1, For all people who were ignorant of God were foolish by nature, and they were unable from the good things that are seen to know the one who exists. Nor did they recognize the artisan while paying heed to his works. And I think that's very interesting because the word artisan here, I, I noted to you yesterday, or last week that the word they have technetis, which is artisan, and, and I didn't put that word down, a, me, a worker for the people. So there, was, there are two words used here, the worker for the people and the artisan. And both of them are applied to God in verse 10. So what's interesting is in wisdom, it says specifically here, nor did they recognize the artisan while paying heed to his works. And so this is considered an allusion to the apocryphal, to this apocryphal work in this. Yes, ma'am. In Romans, Paul says something like that, that, that by looking around the world, we, we should be able to, to know God, or at least to recognize that he exists. And I'm thinking, how... You know, you when you listen to the news today, when you 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 have you you know it, it's almost laughable. People that have not recognized God come up with the dumbest things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they really do. Yeah. 
you know, because of the, you know, whether it's, whether they're talking, you know, like, you know, that we can somehow control the weather, you know, and I'm thinking, Right, you just tried that. <laughs> I wish we could, right? Let's control the weather. Let's see if we can do that. Everybody, what are we going to do? A well, rain dance? President Obama thought maybe we could. You know, he talked about, you know, getting, you know, building um, aqueducts to get flood areas to, to parched areas. You know, and I'm thinking, right, you know, I'd like to see you try that because you never know where a flood is going to be. Well, we, we can't do that because the government has declared that every... Uh, Water, every th piece of water that you can float a 2x4 in is a waterway controlled by the government. And so therefore... Lionel, Lionel they think that a ditch that's dry, literally, yeah. is waters of the U.S. And guess what? So, you know all this flooding in Iowa? Yeah. In Nebraska? You know why? You know why there's flooding in Iowa and Nebraska? You know why, right? Well, part of, part of the part. Remember, one of the purposes. I'm sorry. This is I've I've, I've gone off the rail here. Um, but but this this is a this is an important point about uh, I think the godless world. Okay, one of the purposes of government is to protect private property. So that's what our government did for 200 and something years. They protected private property and they built flood control over the areas because guess what. The Great Plains flood all the time. So they put flood control everywhere. Today we can't manage that flood control because it hurts the wetlands. So guess what? It's gone back to wetlands. It's pristine. You'll get all kinds of birds, but people will die. So, you know, this is the goal of the modern era. But yeah, you know, when, when people come to me and say, like, atheism, I, I can't imagine how a person can be an atheist today. To, the minute someone says they're an atheist, I say, well, you, you can't have been educated. Because, you know, did, did you disprove Immanuel Kant? You know, Immanuel Kant philosophically proves there can't be, there can't be a not God. There has to be a God. So therefore, unless you have disproven Immanuel Kant, since, then you're, you're an idiot. Right? Because if you say, philosophically, I can't believe in a God, there's something wrong with your, your philosophy. You, you haven't studied philosophy. Likewise, if a person comes, like a scientist, if a scientist comes to me and says, I'm an atheist, you go, well, dude, have you ever heard of the Big Bang? I mean, there's even a show called the Big Bang, right? Big Bang Theory. <laughs> have you ever heard of the Big Bang? And, and the science, all the scientists say there's a Big Bang. Well, that means it's not eternal universe. It means the universe was caused, caused created, right? Well, if, if you're so smart, if you're, okay, Mr. Scientist, and I'm a scientist, Mr. Scientist, what's the telic cause of the Big Bang? The Greeks even talked about this in their philosophy. If you can't answer that question, talk to the hand. You're an idiot, okay? And then what we study, right? Now, it'll take longer to set somebody down, but if you talk to them about historical legal, what's called the historical legal method, right? Not the legal criticism thing, but the historical legal method we talk about that's used to prove history. Okay, I try to prove the history to you guys so you have tools, right? Anyone who's studied history and knows how to study history has to say, well, the New Testament is correct and the witness is correct. But if I decide to ignore it, Then I'd ask the historian, well, why do you ignore the New Testament? Because I don't believe that. I'm not persuaded. I'm like, well, yeah. That's the world, right? Remember, Paul went to, the, uh, to, the, to Athens, and one-third said, I believe. One-third said, I want to hear some more. And one-third said, nah, I don't want to hear any more. But guess what? They were smart enough that two-thirds actually were interested. Today, if you bring it up, they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. So, yeah, I, I worry about the world because our educational structures have gone from what I consider very, very positive and good to something that is almost un, unsupportable. I'm, I'm in the middle of reading a book called Why People Don't Believe, and the author is laying out you know, the arguments that atheists will make. And it, for like, they just, they're a straw man. You know, they don't really even know what they supposedly are against. They don't really 
I think that's right. I think I think it's natural. Well, number one, okay. Have you noticed? I, I've noticed this. What do you, what was the characteristic of people in the Victorian era? In the Victorian era, what did everybody do who wasn't impoverished and scrambling for a living, doing everything? Anyone who had any kind of means did what? All the time. They read, they studied. You hear about, you know, if, if you go look at the um, any anything about the Victorian era, the people are, they go find a guy who, some dude or person, woman, it doesn't matter, who's an expert on butterflies, right? And it, they're not at the university. Where are they? Just, just someplace on their estate in London. You know, Oxford, whatever. They're not a professor. They're just an expert on butterflies. Why? Because they've spent their whole life studying butterflies. <coughs> Today, people don't even study the stuff we already have, right? Back in the Victorian era, people believed in work. And, and, you know, they believed not in TV. You know, not in wasting your time watching the YouTube or the cats, cats jumping on YouTube. I mean, people actually use their time to benefit mankind. And they wrote papers. And they wrote books. Today, the average person is what? Sitting down in front of Big Bang Theory and thinking they're getting classics. Like, you know, this, this is like we're living in an insane age where people have all this time. And guess what they're doing? Wasting. They're wasting it and they're killing themselves. The suicide rate in the country is so high. And, you know, because there's a crisis. Yes, sir. And all this leads to someone getting elected to Congress who can actually suggest that we might need to attenuate the output of the sun. It's hard to narrow down at this point. Well, somebody suggested we do a nuclear war. Because a nuclear war would cause, you know, clouds. And I'm like, dude, you don't understand, right? Anyway. It, it, it's it's the world it's the world without God. How, how do you like it, right? Even the Greeks, you know, the funny thing is the Greeks in their world without God were seeking. We have a whole generation of non-seekers, and a lot of non-seekers. The reason they're non-seekers is because they're uneducated, and they're not even educated to the point where they can read, write, and figure. And if you can't read, write, and figure, I don't think you can do anything. You know, um, I'll, I'll mention this. This is just a quick aside. But you know that the era, the era of universal literacy, preceded the era of universal education. You knew that, right? No. We had a higher literacy rate before the era of universal education, because people wanted to read. Why did they want to read? It was more curiosity. Well, they want to read the Bible. Well, they wanted to read the Bible, but even. Even beyond that, they all learned. To, people learned to read the Bible in their home, and their parents taught them. But in the in the age of universal literacy, which remember I've told you, it happened about the end of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s, 1826, when they started printing Bibles like crazy, and everybody could own a Bible. Guess what else they could own? The penny novel. You ever heard of the penny novel? Every every woman, and I'm certain almost every guy, that was working in the factories, pick, um, what do you call them, uh, rag pickers. Rag pickers is not a, a, a negative term. Women were mainly the rag pickers in making the books, in, in getting the cotton fibers to make the books, right? And they're called rag pickers. Guess what the rag pickers had in their pocket? Penny novels. Penny novels. And the minute they got a break, they're reading their penny novels. And it was considered, in the society at the time, was considered so negative. Yeah, low class. <laughs> yeah, it was so low class, and they were learning about, you know, most of the penny novels were, they weren't like the modus ripping, but, but they had men and women talking to each other and waltzing and dancing. Oh, that's so egregious, right? I mean, there was an era when people wouldn't waltz because it was considered... Simple. Yes, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the rich and noble considered because the reels that they went from the country reels anyway we, we have 
<laughs> the world has changed, and now the people can't read, and they can barely spell, and we don't even know our grammar. And it's like, and they're doing, YouTube, you know, they're watching cats jumping in YouTube. So, but they've all got very high self-esteem. But they have, yes, <laughs> but they have very high self-esteem. And if you ask them, if, if you ask them, how good is your mathematics? And they say, well, we're the we're greatest in the world. And, and then you give them a test, and they're like, well, they're not. But anyway, anyway, okay, let's, let's be persuaded. Here's 11. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. All right, that's the NIV. Let's see what it says in the Greek. Through his death, pistis, persuasion, it's not also, it's and. And. Hmm. And uh, chi. It can't really be considered also, there's other words in Greek. Sarah herself, it's uh, autos, herself, received, it's not received, it's lambano. To take. To take. Strength, dunamis. Uh, whenever you see dunamis, it means, okay, okay. Dunamis from dynamic. Dunamis. Okay. Why is dunamis miraculous force or power in the Greek? Why is force considered a miraculous power? Like, for example, the force of, if they knew what gravity was, they would call gravity dunamis. They knew what fire was, they called fire dunamis and lightning dunamis. And boulders going down a hill dunamis. Why? It came from the gods. It came from the gods. Everything was but the gods. Spirits, remember animism? Animism. You start with animism, pantheonic paganism, Mysterion and Gnosticism. Under animism and pantheonic paganism, what makes everything happen? The gods or spirits, right? So that little tree, that's the pear tree growing in front of your house, there is a spirit in that tree. That's why it grows. That's why dunamos force in Greek is always miraculous force. So every force in nature to them was a miraculous force. It came from the gods. Um, dynamos, two, it's ice, it's correct, conceive. Here's that word, the word of the day last week, uh, catabola, catabola. Catabola, bola means to throw, cata means down, throw down, throw down. But remember, I told you we have parabola, diabola, hyperbola, right? All of these terms are geometric terms in the Greek sense. So. <laughs> It's, it means a, a throw down means a deposition, okay, a deposition. A deposition in a Greek sense would be an assumption or a definition, right, in a theorem. So if I have a catabola, so it says, it, it's not conceived, it's catabola, a deposition. Seed, sperma, something sown, and chi, was delivered of a child, it's tik. Oh, and this was the word of the day last week. Tik, tik to. Tik to means to produce literally, um, we get the word child from it, but it means to produce anything. Um, when she was, uh, when, when she was all added, past is a para, it's near, it's near. Karios, an occasion, it's not age, it's karios. Um, because epi thereupon, it's not because it's thereupon, she judged, is not she judged, is hedge omea, to lead, to lead him, it's not him, it's, it's ho, it's the, the pistos, pistos. Um, pistos is to be persuaded, it's the verb, um, or it's the, uh, it's a noun from the verb, it's trustworthy, to, uh, to have been. Um, to have been persuaded. Who had promised? It's not who had promised, it's... It's Evangelia. It's the message of the gods. It's the Evangelia, it's the message of the gods. Who had promised? Why do they keep doing this to us? They did it to us last time, right? 
what was it, nine or eight, where they they tr they, they translated the message of the gods as a promise. <laughs> Just stick with it. Okay, here's the here's the literal <clears throat> Greek. Persuaded and Sarah herself to take miraculous power to deposition something and produce near an occasion, thereupon she led the trustworthy announcement of God. You can almost get it from that, but here's a translation. Persuaded then was Sarah herself to take miraculous power to conceive and produce near menopause, thereupon she led the trustworthy announcement of God. That is a considerably different reading than the NIV. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. Number one, who is the subject? Who is the subject of this Greek? Sarah. Sarah. Who is the subject of the NIV? Abraham. Abraham. Ladies, you should be up in arms. They took away all your seats. All your shine here. And not only that, okay, remember I told you, the view of orthodoxy is that women are the peak of creation. Peak of creation. And therefore, guess what Sarah has become? She, she not only is the one who took the miraculous power to conceive and produced, but she, the, what she did led to the trustworthy announcement of God, the message of the gods. In other words, because of Sarah, we have Christ. the gospel. Yeah, and Christ. Yeah, exactly. Because of Sarah. It, it doesn't say because of Abraham, does it? Yeah, but I'm just saying, the, my, my NIV says, by faith Abraham, yeah. even though he's past age. There's no Abraham in here. That's verse 8, though. Um, That's 11. 11. My, my That's NIV eight. says, by faith That's Abraham. Well, I've got the NIV from, maybe I have an older NIV, maybe they recorrected it, but I've got, my NIV says, by faith Abraham, even though he's past age. But the only issue, Sarah wasn't convinced. What's that? Sarah wasn't convinced. Yeah, as a matter of fact, here's, here's, here it is, Genesis 18. Um, the, 18, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of uh, Mara, Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent. And then the three men came, which they acknowledged were God, right? And then nine, where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Sarah and Abraham were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I'm worn out and my master's old, I will not have, have this pleasure. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say... And actually, these, these are wonderful jokes in Hebrew. These are wonderful jokes in Hebrew that they had to fix for you so that you wouldn't get embarrassed. But she laughed to herself and she thought... Am I, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? And then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Okay, and, and that's another joke, okay? These are, these are wonderful wordplay jokes that we have. And not to say that it's, it's uh, diminishing, but they're humor. There's beautiful humor in this, in this writing, right? And, and we miss it a lot of times because of translation. And 14, is it is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. This is all, this is all funniness, right? The men got up to leave, and she looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see him on their way. So, yeah, but that's why in the, in, that's why it says, persuaded and Sarah herself. So it puts, you know, the other ones were persuaded, 
right? But what's really interesting about this is, and, and I think that if we really dug into the Hebrew, which I didn't do, I, I don't have the time to go digging that deep into the Hebrew, but I think if we dug into the Hebrew and maybe into the Septuagint on this, I should have looked in the Septuagint closer, but if we looked at it, I think we would find that what it says is very interesting. That Sarah herself, Sarah herself, to take miraculous power and conceive and produce near menopause, therefore she led the trustworthy announcement of God. In other words, the other actors, the other ones who were persuaded, were persuaded and did their persuasion, and then later on it happened, right? Where in this, we have an actual figure who is not, not, not just going along, not just doing it, but actually taking it, right? So there, there's something about Sarah in here that's different than the other ones. She was persuaded to the point that she took the miraculous power to conceive and produce near menopause. I, what I think this is, is a reflection back to Shira. Right? To Christ. Because what happened to Mary? She was persuaded, but the angel came to her, and she was... I, I think what this is, is giving an example of Sarah being like Mary. In other words, okay, the angel came to Mary, right? And Mary accepted it, right? Even though the, the angel, you know, the angel basically told her, hey, God's chosen you, you're the one, right? But Mary said, well, I gladly accept it, right? She, she accepted that. And I think Sarah is a similar kind of figure. She, she, she accepted, right? So I, I, I just, I think it's very interesting because I, I love this. We also see this in the genealogies, right? The genealogies where within the genealogies, okay, you've got the guys, the fathers, and right in, in almost every genealogy in the, in the Old Testament, you see the fathers, right, mentioned, fathers mentioned. Do they mention the mothers? <coughs> Only occasionally. Only occasionally. And then when we get to the New Testament and we get the genealogies of Matthew and Luke, guess what we suddenly get? We get, we get women that were specifically important within the train of, their, of, of, of the genealogy. No, I mentioned, but like, like venerated, right? I mean, Ruth, the prostitute, Rahab? I mean, who would imagine, right, that that would be, right? So I think it's very interesting because it goes back, there's, there's something I want to mention. Well, we see it in the Mysterions. Mysterions said that men and women, well, most, a lot of Mysterions said men and women, free, slave, right, all the same. But the Christian, Christianity, which looked like a Mysterion, the Teen Hodos, said that they were all the same. And we see that evidence, I think, when we look at what they say. Um, I think it's funny, though, that my NIV has a different <laughs> thing. Because my, de my devil, he says, uh, by faith, Abraham. So I don't know if that was an so al alternate reading or whatever. Does anybody else have that in there? It says he. Yeah. 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 Yours, it says he. Is it the NIV? Yeah. Uh, interesting, isn't it? Interesting. I, I would I would complain, ladies, but I guess they fixed it in some later version. So, and that's a problem too. Doesn't that bother you? I mean, you should be able to look at, at your version. Like, let's say you're in a textbook. Let, let's say we have a textbook in a classroom. Let's say everybody has a different version of the textbook. How much learning is going to happen? You're toast. So, I, I mean. I just found a little footnote in mine. Uh huh. That says, or by faith Abraham, even though he's too old to have children. Yeah, I didn't check in the majority text to see what the majority so text said. Apparently, there's a couple different translations. Well, there's probably a couple of different. Um, remember, a lot of this is usually done from the majority text, but if it's not from the majority, I have a copy of the majority text here. Um, majority text usually will tell you about differing um, words, 
word usages or words that are used, especially phrases. And you can see them in your Bible in your footnotes because they'll tell you about the phrasing. But it's, it's interesting. So, the so-called foundation. Remember we had that word, the Melvios, that they said was a foundation. And I told you it really wasn't a foundation. We had a couple of uses of foundation that weren't really the same as Basilis or Basilis, which is foundation in Greek. And I told you, so the foundation of the previous, like, I think 8 and 9, right? And it talks about the foundation of the city of God. The foundation of the city laid down by the artisan. Okay, the artisan laid down the foundation. And who put the, fa who put the deposition down? Sarah. Sarah's child was the deposition, was that foundation. I don't like the word foundation, it's okay. But in other words, I don't, I'm repeating myself. Because of, of Sarah and her child, therefore, everything could happen. Without Sarah, nothing would have happened. I think it's very interesting, beautiful stuff. I still find it a little strange that they said that she was persuaded since she did laugh and didn't say it was going to happen. And even earlier, she believed that Abraham would have a child, but not through her, because she then suggested, you know, take Hagar and Abraham along with it. So it seems like, even though there are some ways, they had some serious doubts there. Well, I think that's why in the Greek, and this is what I mentioned before, I'll, I'll reemphasize. In the Greek, if you look at the Greek I gave you, it, every other verse it says, persuaded Abraham, persuaded Noah, persuaded Enoch. Persuaded. It doesn't say persuaded Sarah. It says persuaded and Sarah. Persuaded and Sarah Altos. Sarah herself. So it, it intentionally puts a difference between them. Now, to the Greek mind, why is that important? Because the answer is every one of Anne's theological, or not theological, her philosophical differences, right? All these people understand exactly as well as, well, maybe even better, but at least as well as Anne understands the whole point of, like, Sarah, right? I, I didn't go back and redo the whole Sarah thing, but what she said is exactly right. It'll be read. You know, Sarah laughed. She was, you know, you have these jokes. She even went to the point of trying to do it herself. Guess what? It mentions that here too. Because it says she lambanoed. She lambanoed. She tried to do it on her own power, right? But yet the miraculous power of God, the dynamis of God, the dynamis in the world, made it be. So, you know, um, but I, I still see this as very positive. Because in general, you might see Sarah as kind of a negative, right? But I don't believe that's true. I don't think, I think even in the Old Testament um, viewpoint, the, the uh, uh, Torah viewpoint of Sarah, that Sarah, okay, remember, before the modern, before Christianity, before Teen Hodos, everybody was baited, right? Guess what this persuasion chapter is all about? They're not fated, right? And Sarah is remarkable in the Old Testament because she's the one who took the fate of everything in her own hands, right? When, when her husband, you know, I don't know, um, you, could, you could probably go into this as deeply as you want, but, you know, when her husband maybe wasn't, doing his due diligence, right? She said, well, here, let me give you a slave so that you can a concubine. That's what a concubine is, uh, a slave with, with conjugal rights. I'll give you a slave so you can have the son that was predicted. What did she do? Was she fainted? No. She, she took it in her own hands to do it, right? And you can't blame her for that. I mean, I know there's all kinds of sermons people say, that you, know, you hear from pastors about how we shouldn't, we should wait on the Lord, we should do. But really, it was a custom. 
not only was it a custom, and, and, and what she did did not, okay, is there anywhere in the Bible where it says what she did was a negative? Well, the results spoke for themselves, kind of feel like. Maybe, maybe. I mean, the result was you have the nation of, um, the Arabic nation, right, that was opposed to Israel, but yet, on the other hand, uh, there's a lot. It says here she was, she was the reason for the message of the gods, right? So, now, I don't know. We're, it's totally imagining, but you say, well, what if she didn't? What if she wasn't so fortuitous? And so, um, well, if you look at all, okay, I don't have time to go through all the, all the histories of, era, of, of Sarah and Abraham, but remember, who was taking the initiative through the Lord? Remember, uh, I think uh, he, he said that, uh, did she tell him to, or did he do it? Where he said, uh, tell him that I'm your... Uh, that was him. Your sister. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. It's going to bring up. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay, right. that was all him. Both but, times. But then she took the initiative to basically let it be known in Sar in Pharaoh's uh, uh, harem, right? No. No. Or did he do no, it? Did God, he do it? God. Or, or yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. well, I'm just saying. I I think Sarah is a character that took things in her. I think she took fate in her own hands, and you say, well, that's negative or positive, I think the message of Hebrews and of the Gospels is we should reach out for it and do it, right? And, yeah, I guess Sarah tells us that in the end, Very well. think things will work We're out. still paying for it. <laughs> but it's still paying for mistake. it. Well, was it a big mistake? I, I don't know. You know, yeah. I don't know. Th this gets really deep because you say... You know, in the in the end run, what does it add? What does it end up? But I don't know. I, I think that she is shown here as a very positive figure. And uh, matter of fact, I think okay, some of us would say Abraham was a little bit gorfy, right? But he's pictured as a very positive. But they're positive. Why? Why are they positive? Because they trusted God. They were convinced. That's right, because they were convinced, and, and that's the message, right? That's the point. And, and this, this is the worldview, and they were, going, uh, uh, they were going in opposition to the worldview. So we are not fated. We take it by, you know, and even if it makes mistakes, we pray, God, make sure that it works out in the end, right? So let's go over to 12. I think these are so beautiful because they're so filled with, um, information. They're trying to give us, they're giving us the whole thing in one shot. Yes, sir? I think one of these things about all of this, this particular section coming from the Old Testament is that these look like real people. I mean, there's the laughter, there's the emotions. I mean, it, it, it doesn't look like it's been whitewashed. It's like the whole, all the Abraham stuff. His good moves, his bad moves, you know, Sarah, I mean, it really comes across, you know, these thousands of years. Yeah that these are real people interacting with the world and with God. I agree. And I think that, as a matter of fact, that is one of the internal proofs that, you know, we talk about um, how do you prove the historicity, like the veracity and historicity of the Old Testament. Uh, New Testament's a little different, but especially the Old Testament. And you say, does this look like a normative view of humanity? And the answer is, well, yeah. It does. I mean, this is how we would react, right, if we were in circ similar circumstances. So uh, I find that argument very compelling, right? I find it very compelling. Well, I think it says somewhere in the New Testament, I think, where people sometimes will hear something, and the first initial reaction is, uh, I'm not going to do that, you know, I'm not going to do that, I don't want to do it. But then they actually, later on, they actually do it. So to me, it's not like Sarah and Abraham. At first, they kind of thought, you know, kind of a silly idea and all that, but they actually went through it. But just like with Christians, well, at first, if the proof is the pudding is that you carry it out and you do it. Not that but some people say, oh, yeah, that's a good idea, but they don't do anything. But other people actually, you know, 
do it. Well, I don't know where I get this, but I used to tell my kids all the time, you are what you do. Right? right? You are what you do. And I remember what you say, you are what you do. And when you, and Jesus said to himself, he said, what about the young man that was, you know, told his dad, I'll go out and work in the field, and he didn't? And then the young man that said, I'm not working out the field, but he did, right? And so you are what you do. And I think, uh, you know, if, if anything, that would be kind of a message of, of the, what do you call it, the saved Christian, right? What do we call that? Uh, sanctification. Once, once you know Christ, you're persuaded, you're persuaded enough that you go and do something about it, right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, pr prayer has feet when you do something, right? You pray that your neighbor gets food because they're impoverished. Well, they get food stamps. No, but if you actually go out and do something to help them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. So I can't help but superimpose uh, Miss the Mark on the Sarah story. The Hermantia. If all things considered, she at least picked up her bow and drew it and aimed for the mark. And regardless of what the result was, she had aimed for the mark. I agree with that 100%. That's, that's one of the reasons, and I'm glad you mentioned that, because you, you put it together where I, I did as well as I should. Because I think, and that is, the, that is the complete message of Hebrews especially, but of the New Testament. That as I'll go back to that, you know, it, it's not, she didn't sin, right? She did everything within her culture to make it happen. The point was she had her eyes on the mark. And that's the thing. So, you know, like I said, hopefully we have our eyes on the mark, and if we fail or it comes to naught or something bad happens, uh, you know, I think God's going to say, well, did you have your eyes on the mark? And we go, and if you say, well, no, I was just shooting at random, then he's going to say, well, well, how did that work out, you know? You have more chance of doing more destruction, right, if you're not aiming for it. I think she was, yeah, I agree. She was, she was aiming for the mark. As a matter of fact, that is kind of the message of all of, all of these, right? I'm going to say there's a lot more examples coming up of people who really miss the mark, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and think about this. Remember, I've told you, these are all logos to tell us. So we want to do what? We want to take this chapter and make it the big chapter. But it's really not. It's, it's the convinced, it's the persuaded chapter, right, that's part of the logos to tell us of the overall Hebrews, right? So you just can't, you, you, you shouldn't pull it out and just go, you know, bright, pull out a verse and brush it off and say, you know, this this is what this verse says. Jesus wept. Boy, he kept he was crying all the time. Right? So likewise, each of these ties directly back into the into each of the things we've talked about in Hebrews. This Mark's a great example. So yeah. You keep your mind on, on the other things we've talked about. It's too much, right? I can't even keep it all straight. So, and so many good things that we've been through already. Let's look at 12. Uh, 12. And so from this one man, and he was as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands on the seashore. Hmm. So from this one man. Actually, we learned um, it was... Not one man, was it? Hmm. Let's see what it says in the Greek. Therefore, uh, Dido, through which thing sprang, it's, it's geneo, to procreate. Here the word procreate. There is added, it's not even, it's and. It's apo off, not of, it's off. Heis, one, one. And, chi, hmm, it's not him. It's tauta, these things. As good as dead, necro to deaden, so many is added. Uh, as is not as, it's kathos, it's mm -hmm. just, or in as much, in as much as, just as, as much as. The uh, astron, constellation of the sky, oranos, in, it's not in, it's the, it's hope. 
multitude, plethos, a fullness. Uh, that's where we get plethora and also the, um, uh, what, what's the word, of everything, the plenum of everything, plethros, plenum of everything. Uh, plethos, a fullness, and chi. It's not as, it's os, which how? Uh, the, sand, amos is sand. Which, is not which, it's the, you can use which, but it's, if it's a question. Is is added, it's not by, it's near. Uh, the, thalassa, the sea, shore, chelios, a lip. Innumerable, an, anarithmos, unnumbered. So, here's a literal. Through which thing he procreated, uh, and it's not, he, it shouldn't be he, let's see. There's not a he in there. Why do I have a he in here? Through which thing procreated there? There's not a he. It's, it should be through which thing procreated, she procreated. There's no he, there's no he or she. And off one of these things, he deadened just as the constellation of the sky, the fullness, which how the sand the near the sea lip unnumbered. Um, I'm going to say that the, and I think I've got this wrong, so I, I, I'm going to give you, a, a, I'm going to have to fix this translation because I don't think, I think it apl applies. The uh, subject of the previous statement was not Abraham. It's not a he, it's a she. And I need to recheck that, that uh, verb usage. So through which thing, I would say, he, she procreated and produced one offspring, and these things after they died, if you want, although it is a singular, became the fullness just as the constellation of the sky and unnumbered just as the sand the near the lip of the sea. What I think is interesting about this is, okay, Abraham is not in the previous sentence, the previous statement. Now, we see that there are some versions, some, some, of the, um, some of the manuscripts have put him in there. Now, why do you think they did that? Let... I think, I think the intention of the verse is to have Sarah as a subject, but then to, in the next statement, the assumption is what, not one, two, that both Abraham and Sarah, right? Because they say specifically she's, a, we'll, we'll look at this next week. The, the point I'm trying to make is I think that we see a lot more of uh, positive about this, about both Sarah and Abraham. It's not just Abraham who's the subject. It's Sarah who's also the subject. And I think that's important. It takes two to tango, right? And it wasn't like a, what do you call it, uh, miraculous uh, virgin birth, right? <laughs> exactly. So even though there are parallels. The covenant with Abraham? There is a covenant with Abraham. But it's not, it's the Abrahamic covenant. But it's not the Mosaic covenant. It's a different covenant. Thank you, Father, for your word. Pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray. Amen.